Hey everybody, I'm Jesse, and you're watching Tesla Time News, episode 135 on Now You Know. On today's show, we're going to be talking about the Tesla CCS adapter, the increased performance for the Model 3, and the judge's response for the SEC and Elon Musk. Brought to you by our amazing, wonderful, perfect Patreon patrons and supporters, and sponsored by our friends at the Solar Powered Hotel in Schaumburg, Illinois, the Fairfield Inn and Suites by Marriott. This is the first and only hotel in Chicago that gets a majority of its power from solar, and also from ecoware.us. Do you want a cool t shirt that has its life cycle completely carbon neutralized? Check out ecoware.us. All right, so you may have noticed that it's just me this week. I have lots of arm room, so be ready for that. I'm <laughs> very excited to get started. The first story is about the Tesla CCS adapter. Now, we've been seeing across Europe that CCS is a very common plug. It's becoming more common than supercharger stalls. And Tesla has actually now come out with what looks to be a CCS adapter. So you can plug in a CCS DC fast charging plug like you'd see all over Europe and beginning to see all over the United States. You plug that in, and then on the other side is the regular Tesla adapter, so you plug that into your car, and voila, you now can charge at any CCS station. This is amazing. Okay, this is amazing for basically anyone who drives a Tesla. Not only do you have the supercharger network, which is fantastic, you're also going to have an adapter that will allow you to charge at basically any fast DC charging station. For a while, there was a CHAdeMO adapter, which would allow you to do the same thing, but with a CHAdeMO uh, port that would only give you 50 kilowatts. CCS now goes up to 120 kilowatts, which is the same as a supercharger, which means that basically Teslas now have more superchargers all over the place. Not not always necessarily going to be as convenient as a supercharging station, but it will at least be another option for people who are driving around all the time. Now, I'm glad that this didn't happen before. Now, you might be saying, like, why not? Wouldn't Tesla owners just love to have this CCS plug? Well, before, and I'm speaking from my experience in America, there were not too many CCS fast charging stations, and those that were around basically only had one or two stalls. And this is still the case throughout most of North America. Electrify America is coming. It is going to be awesome. Hopefully, maybe, knock on wood, if everything goes according to plan, um, it should work. That would be great. But for the most part, it's EV go stations, which are few and far between and really have a limited number of stalls. And if Tesla had begun with having a CCS adapter, it would have meant that basically Leafs and Bolts and other electric cars who kind of relied on these EVgo stations would have had their charging spots completely choked by Teslas. There were many J1772 places, you know, uh, Teslas have adapters for that, that were also sort of choked by Teslas. Um, and the CCS were basically some of the only places you could charge a Bolt or a Leaf. And it would have really wrecked havoc on anyone who didn't own a Tesla. So it's really nice of Tesla that they are just starting to implement this now as CCS is beginning to become a more common sight. For the next story, we're gonna go over to Zach, who's in Europe. He is going to talk about charging a Model 3 in Europe. So in the US, when you pull into a supercharger, there's only one kind of supercharger, right? It's just basically got one cable, kind of like this one behind me. That's how we charge a Model 3, a Model S, a Model X. But in Europe, because they have a different charger for the Model 3, you need to have a different plug. So let's see, we got a Model 3 right here, and uh, it can plug in with this supercharger behind me. It's got two cables. Why am I pointing this out? Well, because first of all, you have to make sure that the supercharger you're going to in a Model 3 has those two cables, but also, when you get there, you have to make sure that you're not being, well, I don't wanna say iced, but, but iced by another Tesla, because a Model S or an X could be in your stall um, in charging where you need to charge. So if we look over here, we'll see that there's a Model S, two Model S's actually, that are charging at a stall that a Model 3 could charge at. And if that happens, then basically you can't pull in there because, well, they're charging there. So this is just kind of a public service announcement for all of you drivers in Europe who are driving S's and X's. Uh, when you get to a supercharger and it's got both kinds of chargers, 
if you could just charge at the ones that you can charge at and leave the Model 3 ones so that Model 3s can charge there, well, that would be great. Just a little public service announcement. Very cool. I, I wasn't expecting so many Model S's to be, I guess icing isn't the right word, blocking uh, Model 3 charging spots. I think, yeah, there definitely isn't enough information about it. The people should be notified probably in the screen, like on the screen when you're going to supercharge, just have a little infographic telling people like, hey, don't don't plug in at the Model 3 uh, priority charging spots. So Tesla has just talked about some of the new updates that are gonna be coming out for the Model 3. Um, the one I wanna talk about specifically is 2019.12. Now this update is mainly to the benefit for performance Model 3s. Basically, uh, well, I'll just read what Tesla said. Your car is now able to maintain torque and power for longer periods of time when driving at high speeds. The top speed of your car has been increased to 162 miles per hour. Now, I'm not exactly sure who this helps. I mean, I know that it will definitely help people who drive on the Autobahn, where there is an infinite speed limit. You can drive as fast as you want. But for us normal folks who have to drive at pretty regular highway speeds, something that the Model 3 has absolutely no trouble doing, it's not a huge boon, not a big benefit. Maybe it would help like bank robbers or race car drivers. Like uh, those three types of people. It's a very small update for something that is pretty sweet but it doesn't really help too many people because I've i never driven over, I think, 110 miles an hour, somewhere in that range. I mean, my car can, can get up there, but I haven't driven it that fast. I don't think most people are going to drive their cars that fast. Of course, there's the Autobahn, so happy driving, you crazy Germans. So next, we're going to go back to Zach in Germany to talk about Judge Nathan's ruling on Elon's SEC tweet fight. You may remember Elon tweeted um, and he gave the number of Teslas that they would produce that year. And then he went back and corrected himself to say the annualized production rate because he had sort of mistweeted, misspoke on Twitter and the SEC was going to get him for it. All right. So now I'm going to hand it over to Zach to give his thoughts. Hey, Jesse, Zach here reporting from Amsterdam. And I just got through reading about Judge Nathan's uh, decision on the SEC lawsuit. She basically just dismissed it and sent it back to the SEC saying, you guys have two weeks to iron this out. If we read between the lines, she's basically saying, hey, guys, this did not rise to the level of bringing a lawsuit. This is just day to day business. You should have worked this out yourself. Uh, Elon obviously felt the same and wrote a letter saying, I have great respect for Judge Nathan, and I'm pleased with her decision today. The tweet in question was true immaterial to shareholders and in no way a violation of my agreement with the SEC. We have always felt that we should be able to work through any disagreements directly with the SEC rather than prematurely rushing to court. Today, that is exactly what Judge Nathan instructed. Elon's happy, obviously. Now, going forward, what will he do? Will he um, write a little apology letter, as he probably should if he was smart, to get just get this done with? Um, no, I don't think he will. I mean, he could just so easily say something like, I'm going to, uh, you know, ha come up with a policy where I check all my tweets through somebody first. Mm, but I kind of doubt he's going to do that. I think he's just going to keep poking like he just did with this letter here. Um, so what is the SEC going to do? Well, they're well within their rights to issue a fine if they want to. That's what they do. Their job is to protect shareholders. My argument is, is that if you're investing in Tesla, you know that you're investing in a company with a CEO with a, you know, 22 million followers on Twitter um, and that he does things like this. So you shouldn't be invested in the company if you don't believe in the CEO. Um, and going back to the SEC, they've got to save face, right? So they've got to, I think, issue some kind of slap on the wrist or some kind of fine if Elon doesn't back down a little bit. So in my opinion, the ball is in Elon's court. If he backs down just a little bit, I think he's off the hook completely. If he doesn't back down, I think he's going to get a fine. Will the fine rise to the level of the 420 tweet fine of $40 million? I don't think so. I think that, that you know this tweet was really, really truly was immaterial. So I think that if they're gonna issue a fine, it's gonna be something small. For us out there in Tesla Nation, I think we can all rest easy and know that Elon has dodged another bullet. Question is, did he learn anything from it? Who knows? That's the big question. Anyway, those are my thoughts from Amsterdam. Back to you, Jesse. There are now rumors that more efficient motors are going to be put in the Model S and X. So last year, Tesla's principal motor designer, Konstantinos Lakarius, said, it's well known that permanent magnet machines have the benefit of pre-excitation from the magnets, and therefore you have some efficiency benefit for that. 
Induction machines have a perfect flux regulation and therefore you can optimize your efficiency. Both make sense for variable speed drive single gear transmission as the drive units of the cars. So as you know, our Model 3 has a permanent magnet machine now. This is because for the specification of the performance and efficiency, the permanent magnet machine better solved our cost minimization function and was optimal for the range and performance target. Quantitatively, the difference is what drives the future of the machine, and it's a trade-off between motor cost, range, and battery cost that is determining which technology will be used in the future. Whew, so that was a... Uh that was a good quote. Now, according to people familiar with the matter, the Model 3 motor can register an efficiency higher than 97% compared to around 93% for the Model S and Model X motor. Now you might be saying, this is just a few more percents, but really this has a big implication when it comes to range. Now this isn't just sort of an overall thing. The average discrepancy is more significant in stop and go traffic, where the Model 3's electric motor is much more efficient than Tesla's AC induction motors. And this could add up to a few dozen additional miles of range for the Model S and Model X. Now, the Model S and the Model X, I, it, it doesn't get brought up enough, but these have some of the longest ranges of any electric vehicles in the world. So to think that you could add a couple dozen more miles on top of that, the Model S long range already has a range of 335 miles. 335 add a few dozen more miles to that, and we're looking at like 360? That's insane. I mean, those ranges, I just don't think that people really understand. They, you don't really can practically picture that. I mean, I know that people driving gas cars, it's probably nothing too fancy if you have a really big tank and you're a slightly efficient car, but still, 360 miles of range? Now this doesn't necessarily mean that they need to increase the range. This means that they could decrease the battery size, which could make the car slightly more efficient. And it could mean that the car could be cheaper in the future because you'd need a smaller battery to go the same distance. I mean, 335 miles, I think is just fine in terms of range. I don't think you need much more than that. And perhaps they could still offer a 100 kilowatt hour pack that would get you the 360 miles using these more efficient motors. What does this mean for Model S and X sales? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything good. Um, Model S and X sales have almost completely dried up, mostly because everyone is waiting for a refresh, one that hasn't necessarily been promised yet. But apparently the rumors are so strong that it's going to happen that people are holding off on the Model S and X just to wait and see what the new refresh could be. I'm gonna hand it back over to Zach. He apparently just visited the largest battery charging park in Europe. Hey Jesse, I traveled to Zeebrugge, Belgium, and I went to the ICO Baston terminal where beneath the terminal is 11,000 volts traveling to 308 car charging stations. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, that's 11,000 volts that goes to three high voltage sheds and in each of those are two 630 kilovolt amp transformers which then tr distribute the 3,780 kVA to 304 car chargers with 11 kilowatts each and two superchargers with 135 kilowatts each. All these chargers are equipped with intelligent software and GSM communications so that they can be monitored and controlled remotely. That means that 308 cars can get charged at the same time. Now, pretty soon, 11 wind turbines will be built near the terminal to power this system. Pretty cool, huh? We drove over to Zeebrugge and I kind of pictured that it would be, uh, you know, just a regular small port that you could drive up to, but it's huge. Uh, so it took us like half an hour just to find the port where uh, these ships pull in. And when we got there, uh, there hadn't been any ships for Tesla for about five days. We had visited the Tilburg factory where Teslas are delivered to and they get their final little buffing and any scratches that are in them get taken care of before they're delivered to customers. Um, but there hadn't been any of these ships or deliveries for about five days. So we were kind of bummed because we were expecting to see you know, big ships pulling in in the harbor and cars parked everywhere. But yeah, it's a crapshoot whether or not you're going to get there when the actual ships are pulling in. But at least we got to Zeebrugge and we got to see the scale of it, which is amazing because it's not just Teslas that arrive here. It's pretty much every brand either arrives here or gets shipped from here for, to around the world. Pretty amazingly huge operation. Anyway, I'll throw it back to you, Jesse. Well, wow, it's fantastic, but I, I do wish that you had seen some ships Oh, well, we'll get them next time, I suppose. Although, 
next time there there might just be a tesla factory in europe all right moving on check this out this is the curtis zeus now you may recognize the name curtis it is a traditional bike manufacturer and this is not a gas-powered bike this is an electric bike and uh it's got some pretty insane stats on it it has a 280 mile range that is 450 kilometers and it goes 0 to 60 in 2.1 seconds so this is sort of like the model s of motorcycles and it's got the price tag of one too it cost sixty thousand dollars i think it's definitely outside of the price range for most bikers um so i don't know exactly who is going to get one but i think that it is important to actually have a bike that can do what electric bikes should do sort of like the model s proved what an electric car should do, you know, have a long range, be able to charge fast and be able to accelerate very, very quickly because why not you have the power? I think that this is an important bike. This is sort of, uh, you know, like sort of like the roadster in terms of bikes, right? This is might be a culture changing bike, not necessarily that lots of people are going to buy one, but maybe lots of people are going to want one. They're going to hopefully maybe buy posters of this bike, and they're going to aspire to a bike that is as cool as this. Now, I don't think that it's necessarily going to be the typical biker crowd um, who are going to flock to the poster stores to buy um, a bike that looks like this and has a completely different propulsion system, but I think um, you might gain a new group of people who think this bike is cool, who saw Tron Legacy and were like, that's neat. I want a bike like that. Um, they might see something like this and be like, it's different. It's new. It's futuristic looking. I want that. And I think that, that a bike like this definitely belongs in a movie. I don't know exactly which movie, whether it's going to be a James Bond movie. It's pro probably an action movie, I'd say. Probably. I don't think necessarily it fits in a rom-com. That's uh, all. But if you disagree with me, you can definitely Put your thoughts in the comments down below. All right, Zach has another story from Europe. Take it away. Hey, Jesse. Well, I'm now here in Amsterdam where Weebe Walker began his journey over three years ago. Do you remember this? Uh, Weebe drove off from Amsterdam on March 15th, 2016 in the Blue Bandit, which is a retrofitted station wagon with a range of about 200 kilometers. So take a look at this route. He drove all over Western Europe, then Eastern Europe, the Middle East, India, Southeast Asia, and Australia. That's 95,000 kilometers crossing 33 countries in 1,119 days. Now, if the Blue Bandit had been an ice car, he would have burned 6,785 liters or 1,792 gallons of gas at a cost of about $10,600. But the Blue Bandit is not an ice car. Instead, he used 17 megawatt hours of electricity at a cost of 3,750. See the savings there? But get this, the vast majority of Weebay's electricity was paid for by strangers. When Weebay left Holland, he had no money and he asked people to support him by offering a meal, a place to sleep, or electricity for his car. Thousands signed up on his website and Weebay only spent $300 on electricity, and most of that was in the outback of Australia. Weebay said, Nearly 2,000 people from 45 countries offered to host me, and during my journey, I received so much help. Locals helped repair the car when it broke down, people offered me a couch to sleep on, and many offered a plug to charge the car. I am very grateful for all the help I received, and it changed me as a person. He had only one flat tire during his trip, and no accidents. Walker says his Plug Me In project aims to prove the viability of electric cars. He said electric cars are a way to tackle climate change. I wanted to change people's opinions and inspire people to start driving electric by showing the advantages of sustainable mobility. If one man can drive to the other side of the world in an electric car, then they should definitely be viable for daily use. As we reported last week, Weebay's journey came to an end in Sydney, Australia on April 7th. That was yesterday. Weebay said, I am excited to finish in Sydney because it is as far away from Holland as you can get on Earth. When he returns to Holland later this month, Walker wants to write a book about his journey and remain an ambassador 
for sustainable mobility. Wow, almost 100,000 kilometers. That is an amazing trip. I can't even fathom how long that must have taken. That is amazing, and it, it really does show that EVs can go anywhere, right? All right, so moving on, you may have heard that Fiat Chrysler is apparently going to be pooling with Tesla. Now, they are not having a pool party. I know that a lot of people were thinking that, and a lot of people were upset about them having a pool party. Well, good news is they're not having a pool party. The weird part is it uh, might be even weirder. So the European Commission is instituting a CO2 emission requirement of 95 grams per kilometer for auto fleets next year. Basically what this means is that take any auto manufacturer, take their fleet, all the cars that they've produced that are on the roads, take the average CO2 emissions of that fleet, and that becomes the average fuel emission for the fleet, obviously. Fiat has been lagging behind when it comes to fuel efficiency, and so they're over the 95 grams per kilometer for their auto fleet. What they have decided to do is to pool their emissions together with Tesla to avoid massive fines. So basically, and I have no idea why the European Commission allows this, but basically they're going to pool with Tesla meaning that they're going to take all of Tesla's fleet in Europe and just sort of tack that onto their own. So all cars that Tesla makes have, of course, zero emissions, which means that it's going to drastically lower the average emissions for all of Fiat's fleet and all of Tesla's fleet. Well, just the Fiat fleet, I suppose it's going to lower it. Tesla's fleet's going to go up. Now, this means that Fiat gets to avoid the massive fines and in exchange for pooling together with Tesla, they are going to probably going to have to shell out a lot of cash to Tesla um, to make up for it. Now, there are no financials known at this time, but it is estimated to be worth hundreds of millions of euros. So, I mean, I am uh, one of two minds on this. Uh, on the one hand, I think, well, I think it's strange in general for the European Commission to allow car manufacturers to pool their emissions together. And I also think it's kind of weird, but not super weird for Tesla to pool with Fiat. Obviously, Tesla gets a huge lump of cash for this, and this is this is good for their financials, obviously. Um, investors will be happy to see that. But at the same time, why not just let Fiat take the hit? Sure, I suppose they're going to be paying one way or the other, and maybe they're going to pay a little bit less to Tesla, and so you may as well take all their money. But on the other hand, if it was going to be a substantial hit to Fiat, I don't know, why not let them take the hit and go under? Of course, I am no macro economist. I, I don't know uh, all the reasons why I do this, I would assume they just really wanted the money, which makes perfect sense to me. But at the same time, you know, if you don't produce cars with low enough emissions, maybe you should be paying the fines, uh, which is why I kind of have more of a problem with the European Commission for allowing the pooling in the first place. But overall, this is good news for Tesla. All right, it is time now for the lightning round. Here we go. All right, so the Ford Fevsplorer. This is a Ford Explorer PHEV, so I, I want to call it the Ford Fevsplorer. And basically, this is part of their steps to electrify their fleet. This being a plug-in hybrid, it boasts a whopping 25 miles of electric range, which is pretty sad overall when we're talking about other electric vehicles that have well over 300 miles, but it is a plug-in hybrid, and it should reduce overall emissions and it should be available in Europe in 2020. So the same year that the Model Y is coming out, you know, you're gonna release something with 25 miles of electric range. It's not great, it's not terrible. It is better than a regular Ford Explorer. The funny part is that it's going to Europe. Most Europeans have probably never seen a Ford Explorer. If they saw a Ford Explorer on the road, they would probably drive off the road because it's probably the biggest thing they've ever seen on the road. <laughs> but being a plug-in hybrid for the first 60 or so miles of driving, um, it should have a pretty good fuel economy, mostly because 25 of those miles were zero emission, which is excellent. Overall, again, it's it's not a bad thing, uh, but I just, I always feel like with plug-in hybrids that it could be better. So the e-tron has finally gotten an EPA range and yeesh, is it harsh. The Audi e-tron has only received 204 miles of range according to the EPA. This is with a 95 kilowatt hour pack. That's 50 miles less than Sparky, which came out in 2016 and had a 90 kilowatt hour pack. Now, this is fine. I mean, it's a heck of a lot better than 25 miles, right? But 
Back in 2015, they had promised a range of 310 miles, but they didn't even hit that on the WLTP range, which is sort of like the rosiest prediction of range anyone has ever come up with. The max range, according to that, is 258 miles, which, again, it doesn't hit because it's WLTP, which, of course, means... Uh, well, less than that, actually. Now, Twitter user Alter Vigo uploaded this handy table to check out how off Audi was from its promises in 2015. And you can see there that on every metric that he's listed, they're all lower. They're all worse. Less range, slower acceleration, slower top speed, less power, less torque, and a worse drag coefficient. That, that's fine. It's good to have goals. You don't necessarily have to hit your goals. Um, but Tesla has, maybe not on time, although <laughs> the e-tron was definitely not on time either, but Tesla has usually hit the range goals that they set out to hit. When the Model 3 was announced, it was going to have 215 miles of range. As of now, the base model should have 220 miles of range. Lots of things about Tesla usually end up being better than advertised. And it's pretty sad to see e-tron not live up to the hype that they created. Now let's move on to something a little bit more positive. Harbor Air, a short-haul seaplane airline, announced that it is going to convert all of its fuel-powered seaplanes to all electric. The founder and CEO, Greg McDougall, said we are excited to bring commercial electric aviation to the Pacific Northwest, turning our seaplanes into e-planes. Congratulations, Greg. That was an excellent pun. Now, these are small six-passenger aircraft, but Harbor Air sees over half a million passengers on 30,000 commercial flights annually with 12 operating routes, including from Vancouver to Seattle and Vancouver to Victoria. And just in case you thought that these guys weren't the real deal, in 2007, Harbor Air became the first fully carbon neutral airline in North America through its acquisition of carbon offsets. So if there were any airline in the world who I would feel confident switching to all electric airplanes and be like, they are going to do it. It's this company because they've been carbon neutral since 2007. So battery prices are actually dropping so low that they are now competing with peaker plants. According to Bloomberg, the cost of battery lithium ion storage has dropped by 35% to $187 per megawatt hour. This means that it is competing with, and in some cases easily beating gas generation for tenders for peaking plants, including in the US where gas is supposed to be cheaper than elsewhere. According to Typhon Brandilli, an energy economics analyst at Bloomberg said solar PV and onshore wind have won the race to be the cheapest sources of new bulk generation in most countries. But the encroachment of clean technologies is now going well beyond that, threatening the balancing role that gas-fired plant operators in particular have been hoping to play. As you can see on this graph of battery prices falling, um, PV falling, wind falling, everything has been falling over the, the past few years. I mean, and this has to do with, you know, breakthroughs in technology and also large, large economies of scale. All right, it is time now for the video contributor story. I just want to let everyone know that we are basically out of video contributor story. So if you want to go out this week, record yourself talking about something newsworthy, something that you find interesting in your neck of the woods, there's a very good chance you could see it on the very next show. Please, if you would ever consider it of like, I want to be on Tesla Time News, or this is something that's really important to me, now's the time because you're going to have no Oh, wait, we used to have this long backlog. We'd be like, well, oh, it's going to be three months. Luckily, we have one this week. We have Victor with his Model 3 test drive in France. Take it away, Victor. Hi, guys. My name is Victor. I'm a big fan of you since 2015, and I'm actually a patron. By the way, thank you for the awesome t-shirt. So today, I am in Chartres, France, and I'm going to do a test drive of the Model 3. I am really excited. I just wanted to share my experience with you. Let's go.
that was just amazing, no other words. So great, I just can't wait to have my own. For now it's a bit expensive, but I will wait for the mid, uh, mid range, I think. So now you know. I'm so glad that you had a fun time. All right, it is time now for the Patreon bonus stories. For those of you unaware, Patreon is the lifeblood of this show. It's the only way that we really get to keep the lights on and keep the editors putting in funny stuff all the time. There's there's no way we could do any of this without our patrons. So if anyone wants to support us for a dollar or more a month, you know, we have lots of other perks beyond a dollar, but we wanted to make sure that it was open to as many people as possible. The Patreon bonus stories cost just a buck a month, which turns out to be a quarter per Patreon bonus stories. You get multiple bonus stories. So it's a pretty good bang for your buck. All right, we'll be right back. All right, I am back from the Patreon bonus stories, and I have some people to thank. I have our Patreon patrons to thank. Um, they support this show every week for $5 or more. Um, and as such, they get shout outs. And these people have been waiting for their shout outs for a very long time. And I just want to thank you for waiting. Um, we've increased the number of Patreons that we read out every week. Um, just so that way we can hopefully get as many people as possible. I want you to know that it is still very special to us. I really appreciate every single name. So without further ado, let's begin. Thank you to David Matheson, Joel Ruggles, Harold Hathaway, Jason R. Bender, Christian Bergman, Thierry Chambez, Daniel Landy, Mark Emon, Alex Mayo, Jerkemeyer James, Felipe Perudat, Christopher Brown, Michael Ferry, Mike Mansour, AJ Singh, Paul Kelly, John Overstreet, Stephen A. Sensi, Ronald Emerson, and Quincy Van Vleck. Thank you so much for supporting this show. We can't do this show without you. The, it just wouldn't happen. Maybe we would do it on like a cell phone and we'd upload it straight to YouTube and there'd be all sorts of ums and ahs in it and it'd be unwatchable. But with your support, we are actually able to have editors who edit out all the times that I mess up. All right, it is time now for Elon's Tweets of the Week. At Elon, awesome job on autopilot, really love it. Have one feature request. Swerve the car where possible within a lane to avoid small potholes to increase tire life. And Elon Musk said, definitely. Really? Really? I hate potholes as much as the next guy. In fact, I probably hate them more than the next guy, but really? Can't we just have better roads? Do we have to really rely on Elon Musk to solve this problem for us? How about we actually just deal with the real problem of potholes, which has to do with road maintenance? Potholes should not exist on our roads. Okay, if there are potholes on your roads, you should be getting them fixed. And if they aren't getting fixed, you should be like, why? And almost always the reason is money. It, the, there's not enough money for the highway department. And if there is enough money for the highway department, it's that somebody is dropping the ball on that. I mean, I get that it's a feature request and I get that he wants to make people happy. But first principles, my dude, can we just fix the problem at the source instead of trying to work around. I mean, potholes make everything dangerous. Can we not agree on that? There are many roads in my town where I am driving down the road and I have to go, oh, time to get on the left side of the road because the entire right side of the road will destroy my car. That's, That's not, not a, a road. road. Solve the potholes at the source. Fix the potholes. Sorry, it was a bit of a rant, but man, do I hate potholes. All right, next Elon tweet. Elon says, Tesla Enhanced Summon coming out in U.S. next week for anyone with enhanced autopilot or full self-driving option. He continued, team is working on international versions super hard, by the way. Unfortunately, regulators around the world have different rules and processes, so it just takes time. This is super exciting. Tesla Enhanced Summon is um, a really cool feature for the car. I mean, we did an entire in-depth on it, but... To think that it's coming out next week for basically everyone who has it as an option on their car, that's wicked exciting. Now, another reason why this might be very exciting is that it is another reason to get full self-driving option. At the moment, the only reason that you'd get full self-driving um, would be, yes, down the road, you'd have a full self-driving car, which is pretty freaking cool, but also you'd get drive on nav. Now with Enhanced Summon, 
that just sweetens the deal. All right, it is time now for community mail time, and I'm going to further demand that we have the old community mail time song. I have to agree with Jeff on this one. It was a better song. Guys, I mean, why mess with perfection? Community mail time. Community mail time. It's gold. I mean, we couldn't have paid anyone to come up with a more catchy slogan than that. Our friend Daniel in Switzerland just got his new Model 3. He said, finally, after the long years, it is so much better than expected. Wow, Daniel, congratulations, man. Michael also got his new Model 3. After 1,091 days of waiting, our friend Michael got his Model 3 in Denmark. Wow, Michael, congratulate. I mean, that is, I think, 100 days longer than me. So you held out pretty long. Congrats. Carl and his wife, Eins, just took delivery of their new red Model 3 all-wheel drive in Denmark, and they used our referral code, so we should be visiting you guys. Like father, like son, our friend Remy in Belgium with his new Model 3 delivered on March 30th, 2019, and his father with his Model X delivered March 30th, 2018. Not the only father and son this week. Fabrizio and his son Edward are enjoying their new Model 3 long range. He says, we love it. They'll be experimenting with Enhanced Summon in the coming days. All right, it's time for On Air. I have Wes. He has a question for, well, just me this week. Uh, Wes, what's your question? Well, I was wondering, you know, uh, Elon is always talking about how he wants to further advance the advent of EV technology. And uh, one of the easiest ways they could probably do, and it's something that you guys harp on constantly, is with other EVs, there isn't a really solid charging network. And um, a simple solution to that would be is well, it should be relatively simple, is to make an adapter that other EV owners could use to be able to use a supercharger network. So, I mean, Elon has said that he would be willing to open up the supercharger network to any manufacturer that would help pay for the network. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I don't think any other manufacturer is going to jump on that because historically they've never really cooperated with each other. But I do know that the, the consumers were. I mean, I own a Chevy uh, electric vehicle. And um, I know I would jump on that opportunity and be able to use a supercharger network. I'd even be willing to pay a premium for access moreover than your standard Tesla user does. And I think that, you know, not only would it help with the advent of EV adoption, it would also be a great revenue generator for Tesla in the long term. So I think that you're right. I think that there, I mean, it, there's kind of two conflicting thoughts that I have here, which is that on the one hand, you're right. It would help, you know, the advancement of um, electric transportation. But on the other hand, it is sort of giving um, all the other car manufacturers a free pass to basically one of the best networks in the world. In that respect, I mean, Elon open sourced his patents, so I don't think he's really worried about competition that much. He's continually stated that he would be fine if Tesla went bankrupt tomorrow as long as it furthered the advance of uh, EV technology. But I, I, you know... If Tesla were to go under tomorrow, a lot of this electrification stuff would go away. A lot of car companies, I think, would go like oh, well, we'll produce the e-tron and we'll produce the Jaguar I-Pace and that'll be the end of that. Um, and whew, good thing that was over. You know, we don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> because, I mean, I'll be honest, I think that a Bolt with the supercharger network is, I would be swayed. I would, I would be like, hmm, you know, I might consider it. Which is a good thing because it means more access to more cars for more people, which I agree with. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if Chevy could just walk all over um, Model 3 sales, walk all... I mean, they wouldn't. They don't have the production of batteries oh, and know. stuff like that. But that would really give Tesla a run for their money. Like, supercharging has been one of the things, at least in America, has been one of the things that really sets Tesla apart. And I think that they would lose that competitive advantage. I mean, it's a huge moat for them, basically, to have that. Unless there's this stick behind the automakers that's constantly smacking them in the butt going like, come on, make some electric cars already, um, that they won't. Um, and Tesla is that stick. They are constantly prodding them to move forward with electrification. And I think that without that, we would not have seen the bolt. And I think the thing is, is once, you know, they've met the, the requirements of the settlement that they're not going to expand on it further. And it just leaves the average consumer, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, SOL. And the, 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 the big auto, auto manufacturers are, are never 
going to make their own charging network. And they're never going to really be able to compete with Tesla in the long term just because Tesla, with the, the battery, with the Gigafactory and whatnot, they're going to be able to continually drive their prices down, whereas GM and, and Nissan and whatnot, they're so far behind, they won't be able to compete on price. But in the short term, I think that it would be a serious net gain for Tesla because, I mean, they could charge a premium because there's spots in this country you can't travel. You're in, absolutely in a, right. Non Tesla EV, where if people had access to the supercharger network, they would be able to travel it. I mean, they could they could place limits on it. They could charge twice what it would cost, and it would help with their finances. And it would it would help with the adoption of uh, EV technology. Now, like me, I know when I got to take a long road trip, I'll take the Volt. It has a gas engine as backup. And, you know, if I go to a, a, a charge point charger or an EV go or something and it's not working, I'm screwed. That's absolutely you know? right. No, I hear what you're saying there. And imagine for a minute if there was no Tesla supercharger network. Well, I guess yeah. I guess they wouldn't have sold as many cars. That's quite obvious. No. But but at the same point, you know, the, the world would be you know all the plug all of the plug share and the charge point chargers would be littered with teslas yeah. and there would be no way you would know that if as soon as you got to the um the ev go charger that it would be completely packed all right well thank you so much so. for calling in wes we're glad to have you on all right well it was nice talking to you and it is time now for supercharger reviews this is where people from around the world who watch this show record supercharger reviews this is where you review a supercharger or a tesla destination charger um, and then you upload it to our website and we call through them every week and we find some of the best ones to show you. And here they are. Hey, Zach and Jesse. We're here at the Somerset, Pennsylvania Supercharger. It's a six stall charging location. It's right off the turnpike, which you can hear the road noise behind me. Uh, it's, you can see it's right behind a Wendy's here. It's in the back of the Wendy's parking lot. Um, looks like there's a Wendy's here, a, um, uh, a Ruby, Tuesday. Ruby Tuesdays, there's Verizon. a Verizon store, there's a Starbucks, there's an Eaton Park restaurant, so there's plenty of things, to, oh, and there's a McDonald's across the street, it looks like, so there's places to eat, places to use the bathroom. Overall, I would rate this stop and eight out of ten and now you know hi there zach and jesse this is dan out in las vegas at the new railroad pass supercharger here off of the new interstate 11 between las vegas and phoenix arizona uh, they have a capriati sandwich shop and a gas station here um, as well as great views and also the uh, the old railroad pass hotel so i'm sure this is going to be a superb addition to the property and it's going to bring in lots of revenue i'm sure all right you guys keep up the good work and thanks for keeping us all updated on tesla have a great day hey everyone this is michael i am at the eight stall supercharger in lemonster massachusetts i think that's how you say it that's how you say the one in england anyway um this supercharger is sort of confusing because the pairs are back to back to each other so my ren model s over there is on 2a but 2b is facing it right in front of it so that took me a minute to figure out um not that it's an issue now since there's not uh, almost no one here um it's at the whitney field mall um there's a uh, panera bread uh over there and tons of shopping of course as it's a mall and there's a uh, food court inside as well as restrooms um i was a little bit annoyed because while it's close to the highway, the superchargers are sort of on the far end of the mall parking lot from where you get off the highway. Um, but other than that, it's a great location. I would give this six stars. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and just keep in mind, everybody, like if you're recording it on a phone, don't record like this. Record like this. All right. Time for new superchargers. And there are a crap ton of new superchargers. So I'm just going to read through the list here. Um, as fast as possible so that the show doesn't end up being four hours long. A 10-stall supercharger in 
Kapel Grafhausen, Germany, an eight stall in Slovansky Brod, Croatia, a 10 stall in Whitlish, Germany, a 24 stall Urban in Fontana, California, a 14 stall Urban Supercharger in Corona, California, a 16 stall in Hertenbosch, Netherlands, a 10 stall Supercharger in Fontainebleau, France, a six stall Supercharger in Bathurst, New South Wales, a six stall Supercharger in Sintangen, South Korea, a four stall Supercharger in Nubo, New South Wales, an 8-stall supercharger in New Taipei, Taiwan, a 10-stall supercharger in Hangzhou, Dikai International Star of City, China, a 6-stall in Taurin, number 1, Binhal Hot Springs Hotel, China, that sounds fun, a 16-stall supercharger in Warve, Belgium, a 10-stall supercharger in Shenzhen at the 1983 Creation Town, China, a two-stall supercharger at the Guangzhou Jingjiang Jeffa supercharger in China, a 20-stall in the Hangzhou Sinu Ocean, China, a six-stall in Chenzhou Wyndham Hotel, China, an eight-stall in Wuxi Hulare Hotel, China, a 10-stall in Shanghai South Balian, China, a 20-stall in Xiang In City Plaza, China, a 20-stall urban supercharger in San Ramon, Diablo Plaza, California. And finally, an 8-stall supercharger in Alcantaria, Portugal. I don't know how many superchargers that was, but that was a lot. And a lot of them were in China. And a lot of them were at hotels that were very hard to pronounce. And I'm sorry to everyone in China. All right, it is time now for Be Free. That stands for Businesses for Rewarding Elon Employees. This week, we have Ronald Long. He will give a 500 Visa gift card to any Tesla, SpaceX, or Boring Company employee with the installation of a purchase or lease of a photovoltaic solar system from Public Utilities and Environment PV Solar System. And here is the link which you can go check out. That is an amazing deal. Um, and he's located in Downey, California. It's the Patreon giveaway. All right, it is time now for the Patreon giveaway. I'm going to move the Patreon exclusive mug over to the side as I grab our big barrel of fun. All right, the winner this week is going to win anything from ecoware.us. Everything on there is carbon neutral from the time it arrives on your doorstep to the time that you can't wear it anymore because it's so full of holes. And the winner is Simon Quavang. Congratulations, Simon. You can pick out anything you'd like on EcoWare. We will reach out to you on Patreon. And I hope that you enjoy your prize. And that's it. You've made it to the end of the show. And so have I. I did it all by my lonesome. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that I did a good enough job, but I'm so glad that you watched this show. I mean, th this is amazing that we, you know, have been putting out this show for 135 weeks and we've never stopped. And despite me being sick and Zach being in Europe, we still were able to bring you the news. As I was telling our Patreons, like I just didn't think this would ever be possible. I didn't think that we would be reaching 100,000 subscribers. And I just want to thank you. Like I know that not everyone is, has money in the bank to support us on Patreon. I know that some of you not might not be old enough to support us on Patreon, but I appreciate you watching anyway. You know, <laughs> we couldn't do this show if people weren't watching it and if people weren't subscribing. So be sure to subscribe. You might be the 100,000th subscriber, which is pretty exciting. Being able to come in here every week and record you the, the most kick-ass show that we can do takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of our weekends. It takes a lot out of us to do this show every week and, but we, you know, it, we wouldn't be able to have been replenished if it weren't for our patrons who, you know, are reaching out to us on Discord, talking about the, the news of the day, you know, giving us their support, not only in dollars, but also in just communication and being there for us and um, offering us really, really nice things, you know, offering to put us up in, in, a, in their houses if, if we're on our way somewhere and we need to stop somewhere for the night. Um, it, it really means a lot to us, and I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for watching. Now you know. <laughs>